Thanks for tuning in, fellow Res heads. I am Danny Riggs, and welcome to Res History Episode 2. In the first episode of this series, we covered Santa Dog. So today we will, of course, be talking about the group's first LP release, Meet the Residents. But before we get to that, I'd like to thank a few of the people that commented on the Santa Dog clip. Barton Bischoff, the producer of Theory of Obscurity, revealed that the company in the Sycamore building before the residence not only printed Kennel World, but also magazines of a more adult nature. That could explain a heavily censored album cover, but we're not getting into that now. Yerk During pointed out that Residence Unincorporated was also used on the original Satisfaction cover, which I wasn't aware of, because I don't have it. And John Bauer raised an interesting point. He thinks that the writing credits of B. Barnes and C. America allude to the Marvel characters Bucky Barnes and Captain America, which sounds valid to me. Not being a big comic book guy, I hadn't even thought that far. To all three of you, many, many thanks for your comments. And to everyone out there, please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. And if you're interested in helping to research and film these segments, please hit me up. Any help is greatly appreciated. Before we really get started, I would like to name and thank the multiple sources that helped me research this clip. That is the Meet the Residents wiki. That would be the booklet of Meet the Residents Preserved, written by Ian Shirley, as was his book, Never Known Questions. Another shout out goes to the Cryptic Guide, as well as to Uncle Willie. But on an interesting side note, the text in Uncle Willie's Guide is actually an excerpt from this book, Sonic Transports, written by Cole Gagney. I'm going to say Gagney. I don't know if that's right. It reminds me of James Cagney. I hope that's right. If you're watching and it's wrong, I'm sorry. So now let's dive into our subject for today, Meet the Residents. The album was recorded between February and October 1973 and was released on April 1st, 1974. According to multiple sources, 1,050 records were actually pressed, but anywhere from 100 to 200 were not used due to warping. The design of the album, just as its name, was a reworking of the 1964 album Meet the Beatles, which was the second U.S. release by the Fab Four. The artwork for Meet the Residents is credited to Porno Slash Graphics, a.k.a. Homer Flynn. The front of the album shows the faces of John, Paul, Ringo, and George, which have been humorously distorted with crossed eyes, vampire teeth, devil horns, mustaches, etc. The tagline on the cover of the Beatles album, the first album by England's phenomenal pop combo, has been changed to read the first album by North Louisiana's phenomenal pop combo. The back of the album also copies every facet of its Beatles inspiration, starting with the tagline at the top, you've read about them in Time, Newsweek, the New York Times. Here's the big beat sound of that fantastic phenomenal foursome. This was, of course, not true of the residents, at least not at the time. In all honesty, I don't know if any of those publications have ever written about them. If they haven't, they should. And if you know, let us all know. Under this lifted quote from Meet the Beatles, we read Residents Unincorporated, proving once more that Santa Dog was not the only use of that name. The placement of the label logos and text blocks, the choice of fonts and font sizes, and another reworked Beatles photo round out the rest of the sleeve back and copy the Beatles record perfectly. The picture is another defacement of the Beatles, this time with John, Paul, and George portrayed with crawfish heads and claws and aptly retitled with crawfish as a last name. Ringo Starr has been turned into a humanized starfish and his name reads Ringo Starfish, of course. For those of you who might not know, crawfish are one of many seafood standards typical for Louisiana. Hank Williams Sr. included the dish crawfish pie in the lyrics of Jambalaya, 
also known as On the Bayou. Jambalana, crawfish, pine, feely gumbo. There's also an Elvis song from his movie King Creole titled Crawfish, which I love. But I digress. The text on the back of the album is the first installment of much of the res lore we've all come to know and love. A huge collection of tapes of all kinds of music and sounds. The first mentions of Snakefinger and the mysterious N Sonata, including the latter's theory of phonetic organization. Hal Halverstadt and the fruitless pursuit of a contract with Warner Brothers. The album even says that Ensenada eventually disappeared and that the residents guessed that he had gone somewhere to the Arctic, which predates the backstory of Eskimo by a good five years. The back further states that Ralph Records is also backing, that is financing, the residents' first feature film, Vileness Facts, which suggests that they had initially planned to make more than one movie. This lends credence to Hardy Fox's statement that the residents were failed filmmakers, as he said in the movie Theory of Obscurity. The small print over the photograph on the back are the credits to the album, composed and arranged by the residents, of course, except for Boots, written by Lee Hazelwood, which we'll get to in a minute. Nobody But Me, performed by Human Beings, which reveals the only sample used for the album. Vocals on Smelly Tongues are credited to Wool, which Homer Flynn would later reveal to be Barry Island, whose nickname was Red Wool, thanks to his red hair. Among a small group of pre-resident friends, Barry Island, the younger of the two brothers, was affectionately known as Red Wool, a tribute to his striking red hair. Vocals on Breath and Length, Ruth Essex, who Discogs only credits with this release, so no idea. Vocals on Spotted Pinto Bean, Pamela Weeking, who was actually Pamela Zayback, I hope it's Zayback, not Zayback, who would go on to perform live with the band and can also be heard on the Third Reich and Roll. Oboe on Spotted Pinto Bean, Philip Freehofner, who also played organ on the 1998 Negative Land album, Happy Heroes. Piano on Spotted Pinto Bean, James Whitaker. Wait for it. Bass on Infant Tango, Bobby Tagney. Both Whitaker and Tagney can be found in the credits of the Delta Nude's Greatest Hiss album. And bass and guitar on Infant Tango, James Aaron. Both Aaron and Tagney were mentioned by Hardy Fox in Hacienda de Bridge newsletter number 15. Although Tagney is credited with guitar in the newsletter and not bass, but that's not really important, I guess. All other instruments by and produced by Residents Unincorporated. Cover design by Porno slash Graphics, like we've already said. Based on a photograph by Robert Freeman, who was a British photographer and graphic designer best known for his work with the Beatles. The last line is, special thanks to the Beatles and Apple Corps Limited, which was the Beatles' own corporation, the name being a pun for Apple Core, that is the middle of an apple. And of course, they also thanked Capitol Records, who not only released Meet the Beatles, but also the Human Beings album. So with all that data under our belts, let's take a look at the tracks of the second release by The Residents. Wait, their second release? Is that true? First came Santa Dog, then... Before the release of Meet the Residents on April 1st, a flexi-disc containing almost seven minutes of music from the album was included in the February issue of File, a Canadian art magazine. The magazine also featured a full-page advertisement for the album on its back cover. Excerpts from the following tracks were used for the flexi. Num Er One, Gylem Bardot, Smelly Tongues, Rest Aria, and NRG Crisis Blues. 
This montage is much like the concentrate that the group has released many of over the decades, and sadly, it has never been re-released. So, if you're listening, guys, let's do that. Okay? Okay. 4,000 of these flexies were made, and 3,000 of them were inserted in the magazine without any sleeve. The ad features a boldly printed line reading, The first one is almost free which is based on the cliché of drug dealers enticing their clients into addiction by giving them their first hit on the house. A coupon at the bottom right of the page could be sent to Ralph Records to buy the full album for only $1.99. The text of the ad reads, Yeah, that's right, hippies and squirrels. The first one is almost free. And do you know why? Do you have any idea why we would have 1,000 records pressed to sell for $1.99 each while losing 85 cents on each one? Well, I'll tell you why. It's so that you'll know our name when you freak out over this groovy, out-of-sight disc. It's real hip, too. And what's that name, you say? It's Univac Rezcor. Yeah, that's right, Univac Rezcor. Now don't forget it, Univac Rezcor. Once we sell this first thousand and get our name spread far and wide throughout the land, why, we'll order some more and goose that old price up a little. Then, when all those are gone and this thing is a stone smash hit, we'll put out another record and jack that goddamn price up sky high. Pretty good plan, huh? And you can be one of the first to help us get it all together by rushing us that two bucks and by remembering that name. It's Univac Rezcor. That's it, Univac Rezcor. Now don't forget, hippies and squirrels, Univac Rezcor. Sincerely yours, Residence Unincorporated. Why Univac Rezcor? No freaking idea. Univac was a line of computers. The first one built under that name was in 1951. Is there a connection? Again, I have no freaking idea. The remaining 1,000 flexies were sold by Ralph Records starting in 1977. They were stapled into a black and white sleeve that used both photographs from the album. The back of the sleeve also features a coupon for the $1.99 deal, some of which were stamped VOID or had the word VOID handwritten onto them. This was done to clarify that the discount deal was no longer available. Many were also stamped with the Cryptic Corporation's new address at Grove Street because the coupon itself still featured Sycamore Street. And while we're on the subject, the same advertisement appeared in a magazine called Friday that was distributed at different colleges in San Francisco starting in May of 1974. According to all accounts, these ads did little to nothing to help boost album sales, but you've got to love the idea for its sheer creativity, if nothing else. So, like I said before that excursion into innovative marketing techniques of the 1970s, let's take a look at the tracks on Meet the residents. Side A starts off with Boots, a reworking of the Lee Hazelwood song that was popularized by Nancy Sinatra, daughter of Frank Sinatra. These boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. This is the first Residence cover version, many of which were to follow on future releases, and all the trademarks for residential handling of others' music is already here. Where the Sinatra version is a groovy and swinging example of 60s music with a legendary laid-back bass riff and a full studio sound, the Res version features an almost toy-like honky-tonk piano and off-kilter horns. Ian Shirley wrote in the booklet for Meet the Residents Preserved, that the singer on the song makes beef heart sound like Elton John. I love that. I love that. Mr. Shirley, if you're watching, I just want you to know I love that. Boot segues into the next track, Num Er One. Read with the pause resituated, this would mean number one. The way it's written, though, adds up to numb, meaning without a feeling, sedated, like when your foot falls asleep. The er one part confuses me. Apparently, it's a name derived from the Greek word for hero. Is this some literary figure I'm not aware of? I don't know. 
The instrumental track starts off with a groovy, distorted piano bass line that soon adds a melody. Percussion, possibly a shaker of some sort, accompanies the piano in its 4-4 beat until it stops, only for the melody to return again in 4-4, however much slower and not in sync with the start of the song. The last three notes of the melody begin to repeat in triplets towards the end of the song, which segues into the next track, which is in 6 eighths. That song is called Guylem Bardo. When read together, that amounts to Guy Lombardo, who was a violinist and big band leader that was active from 1924 until his death in 1977. This reference signals someone's knowledge, possibly love, of big band jazz and swing, which, considering some of their later releases, is not surprising at all. I couldn't find any meaning for Guylem, but the second word in the name of the track, Bardot, surely alludes to Bridget Bardot, who was a sex symbol, actress, singer, and model starting in the 50s. This time, it's the bass line of the song that continues over into the next, which is named Breath and Length, which not only features female vocals, but also something I've always thought was recordings of a dog barking. But maybe it's a human making that sound. I've heard some people can do that. This song also includes the first use of guitar on the album, so that is probably Bobby Tangney, who Hardy Fox credited as the very first guitar player on a Residence album. There's a short laugh from the vocalist that leads into the next song, Consuelo's Departure, which mixes time signatures in a way better heard than described. A mix of percussion, piano, guitar, bass, and a male voice sometimes blaring along with what is possibly a saxophone, this track ends with strong bass-heavy phrases that lead to the bass line of the next song, Smelly Tongues. Sung by Barry Redwool Island, Smelly Tongues features wonderfully simple guitar sounds over a killer beat, and as the bass drum and vocals start to fade out, we are treated to the first real break on side A of the album. The next track, Rest Aria, starts off as a simple piano piece, more melodic than what we've heard up till now, until it evolves into a more complex mix of textures supplied by glockenspiel, horns, bass, and oboe, and what sounds like a droning cello. During the end of the song, there are overlaps of piano pieces before a saxophone sets in, shortly before the track fades out. It's interesting that this song is named Rest Aria, a pun on rest area, the spots on the side of the roads used to take breaks, seeing that it is the first track that actually has a break before it. The next song is a short piece named Scrats. This name could be a mix of the words scratch, which is used repeatedly in the lyrics, and the word scat, which is a term for singing random syllables and sounds most often found in jazz and swing music. More on that in two tracks. A sound is used in the song that strongly resembles record scratching, which would be popularized much later in rap and hip-hop. I think this is a coincidence, but I think it's a very interesting one. How this sound was made in 1973, we'll probably never know. The last track on side A is Spotted Pinto Bean. A pinto can be multiple things. A type of horse. A type of bean. A model of a car once made by Ford. In my mind, I think the title was chosen for this reason. It fits well with the philosophy of creating something that is impossible to categorize. The song is the longest on side A and contains operatic voices, jazzy horns, loungy piano, among many other influences and styles. Once again, it must be heard to be understood. Assuming it can be understood. Side B opens with Infant Tango. The name is a pun on the disease of the same name. Please look that one up yourself if you're interested, because I don't want to get into that. The music of Infant Tango starts off easy enough, very funky, a la James Brown, until the horns and vocals set in. Sounds easy enough when described, but the genius thing is, is that the horns and vocals are playing in a completely different chord than the guitar and bass. A totally radical approach for the time, and something that would become an often used technique in residential compositions of the years to come. And as mentioned a minute ago, this song actually contains scatting. 
The next to last song of the album, Seasoned Greetings, starts off sweetly with piano, adding horns, etc., before it branches off into different styles, only to reprise the opening at the end with a very familiar voice wishing his family a Merry Christmas. The title is a play on Seasons Greetings, with the first word traded for seasoned, as in spiced, salted, peppered, whatever spice you like. The last track of the album is titled N Er G. The label on side B adds a Crisis Blues Suite. Starting with the 1977 reissue, the song is simply titled N Er G Crisis Blues. The name probably alludes to the 1973 oil crisis, which is easy enough to research online if you're interested. This is the longest song on the record, and it moves freely from style to style as the rest of the album does. It is also the only song that makes use of a sample, Nobody But Me by The Human Beings, originally released in 1968. Interesting side note, the song was actually written and recorded by the Isley Brothers in 1962. As Ian Shirley wrote in Never Known Questions, the album closes with a slow fading chorus of Go Home America, 55 will do, meaning 55 is enough, a direct commentary upon the thousands of American casualties during the Vietnam War. Whew, that was nine pages of info and I did not even get into how the record was recorded. I guess I will have to make a clip on the pre-residence and how it came that they started to record it all. Help! Suffice it to say that the record only sold 40 copies in its first year and has since, of course, gone on to become a very hard-to-find collectible. There have been numerous re-releases. Discogs lists over 40, and I have it on good authority that that does not even come close to all the variants on LP, CD, and MC. I would like to talk about three of the re-releases, but only briefly because I don't want to bore you. The second issue in 1977 used the picture from the original back cover for the front, which was reworked by Homer Flynn with a beautiful background. The original front cover was used on the back of that release in a smaller size. This was supposedly done after Capitol Records threatened legal action if the change was not to be made, which really reminds me of We're Only In It For The Money by Frank Zappa, but again, I digress. This release was also remastered and mixed in stereo, whereas the original was mono. It is almost seven minutes shorter than the first release. This was achieved by trimming out different parts of songs. The cryptic guide to the residents states that after these trimmings, the residents liked the result even better than the original. 1985 saw a picture disc LP reissue with both versions of the cover art, one on each side. This was a 13th anniversary special edition to celebrate, well, 13 years of the group's existence. We talked about the 1988 release on CD, which was the first digital release in the Santa Dog clip, so we're not getting into that one now. The last version of Meet the Residents I'd like to address is the 2018 Meet the Residents in the Preserved series by Cherry Red Records. This edition features the mono and stereo versions of the album, includes all four tracks from the Santa Dog set, and a great collection of tracks that were all recorded around the same time Meet the Residents was recorded. I love the bonus material on this. It really helps to paint a portrait of the group in that first phase of their existence. Some of these tracks are alternative versions of the songs that ended up on the finished album, including a version of Num or One with vocals, and versions of Boots and Smelly Tongues that are sung by other people. There are also tracks that are completely original, Spotted Pinto Queen and Poisoned Popcorn, for instance, 
and a total of six tracks of experimentation called 1 through 10 with a touch of 11, parts 1, 4, etc. Before I sign off, I'd like to give an extra special shout out and thank you to Andreas Matovs of the Eyeball Museum, not only for the pictures he let me use, but also for everything else he's ever helped me with. Thanks a lot, Andy. Before I forget it, sorry if I promised to use some clip that I ended up not using. YouTube has recently changed its uploading process and videos using music that you do not have the copyright to can be flagged. And so, of course, I wanted to avoid that. Thanks for understanding. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Res History. And if you would like to help me research and fill in these segments, please, please hit me up. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. All of my profile links are down there in the description. It would be great if you liked this video, if you actually liked this video, and it would be cool if you hit subscribe. And of course, stay tuned for the next episode of ResTube, whenever and whatever that may be. So until then, you guys stay healthy and stay weird. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. The album was recorded between February and October of 2000, 2000, my God. There's also an Elvis song from his film King Creole that is named Star, Starfish, man. Hal Halverstadt and the Fruitless, man. The Resident's first feature length film, Wildness Fetch, which was reworked by Homer Fritt.